Okay, so again, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And we have Janet Dunn, National Classification Lead, who is going to present um, and is also going to answer questions that you may have about classification. I will repeat that while she's presenting, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or save them and we will have um, time at the end for just a question and answer period. So Janet, thank you so much for being here and the floor is yours. All right, I apologize for that. I have used my iPad for almost every meeting that I've had in the last maybe eight months because it just connects better. So I have not had to, I think, since maybe last year when we were doing Paris swimming uh, information sessions. So I will be mindful that we're recording it, although I will apologize in advance for my often colorful language. Um, I told Art I was going to say this. She wasn't so sure. I didn't start out with any goal in mind to be a classifier. I was a coach with a background and I couldn't tell if my swimmers were good or not good. My track athletes were good or not good. What my point value would be for the basketball players I worked with. So back in the good old days, as my son Noah will say, I read manuals figured out how to do it. And from there, we just kept going. Um, and there are often left turns in your life that you take, or maybe they're right turns. And in 1985, yes, count on your fingers. I went, I was sent by what would be CP or um, CPC now, but was CP, uh, CF sod, I should say. Uh, to the first ever functional classification system. It was in Holda, Germany. It was 1985. And to quote Star Wars, once you go to the dark side, forever will it be your path. So at that point, came back and um, it doesn't take much to be an expert in the old days because nobody's done anything. So you get to be as much of an expert as everyone else. So over time, which is a few decades now, I have been doing this. And uh, when you have two kids under two, you narrow your focus and swimming my first love is where my focus um, remained. Although as a founder of Canadian CP Sports Association, I still go out and classify bocce uh, when need be. And I have gone and done a few things for other sports organizations when they haven't been able to get there. But I would say probably from 1992 on, uh, my primary classification has been swimming. So. Now, I may not have set out to be a classification expert, but I certainly have a lot of classifiers who are dedicated and committed. I have people who have worked in classification two or three decades. Um, and uh, so it's something that I find uh, uh, professionals will give us their time and their efforts. So today we're just gonna talk about classification, what it is and why it's important. And maybe it will also kind of open people's eyes as to how uh, I see it and how we try to lead it within Swimming Canada. So swimmers don't need classification to develop in sport. We have a technical sport and you have to be technically ready for classification. You need to have all the good foundations, technical skills, starts, turns, floats, uh, good, clean swimming, right? You do not have to know what your sport class is to be a swimmer. However, if you are in a 
para sport that has your impairment and your sport class as its first criteria. Basketball, you have to see whether you meet the criteria, what your points are in order to play the game. The same for wheel chair rugby, uh, bocce, the same thing. They can't, but for us, we need to be swimmers first. And coaches need to account for classification in their development plans. You know, so for those who are going to Saskatoon, you don't have to put your hands up, especially since I don't know how to use Zoom anyways. I wouldn't see. Um, how many of you were aware that your swimmer was eligible for or should be having a level three evaluation this year? I sent at least 40 emails out identifying that we have had probably 25 responses and we have 21 coming to Saskatoon, which I'm very grateful for. So classification isn't the platform that we build um, our swimmers on. It is. It needs to be part of your long-term plan. So I will always, when I'm working as a performance link in my role as a coach, I make sure that the coaches I'm working for have figured out where and when they're going to need to do their international classification. For some swimmers, classification only ends when they retire. And Maybe not then, because sometimes I have them come out to be good examples at training. And there's no good or bad sport class, just a fair one. Sport class evaluation, which is classification, that's what you request, right? Considers the extent of the impairment on the activity. It is, first of all, you have to be eligible. There are many, many impairments, physical, visual, and intellectual, you know, learning, I guess is the better term there, that are not eligible. It does not mean that the person does not have an impairment. It's just we are adjudicating a system with rules, regulations, and limitations. The second thing we need to do is establish a minimal impairment. So for physically impaired, we have tests on the bench in the physical assessment. If I were to put somebody with no impairment on the bench, they need to score. They would score 300 points to be eligible for the next step, they would have to meet the criteria of minus 15 points in either the freestyle or the breaststroke. And then after that, we verify it. It's a standard process that we do, okay? It's fair and equitable. It's the foundation for para swimming. It's a system designed for elite swimmers. And because of that, we've gone to three stages here in Canada because you cannot take an eight-year-old and apply a system that is meant for people who are attending world championships or the Paralympics. Without classification, there is no sport. There is no way to put the number of impairments we put together between physical, visual, and intellectual and have it be equitable without a system before the functional system for the um, physically impaired, it would be possible to go to the Paralympics and between male and female, get up to 32 gold medals in the 50 free. So however flawed the system was in 1985, and there were not little flaws, there were huge ga gaping wounds in what didn't work. Um, it put us into a position where swimmers actually got to race. 
So they do not require sport class to swim. So we get many, many requests for conditions that will not be eligible, or we get swimmers that have many learning issues. We get swimmers who are visually not capable of having a driver's license, but they're not considered eligible in, our, in the system for classification, but they still benefit from swimming. When I get a request for somebody at the level one or at the level two that I know based on the description, they won't be eligible, I phone the parent because I really think parents don't deserve more than an email that says your swimmer doesn't have the right kind of disability because they wouldn't have identified this if they weren't needing support. And sometimes we're able to give it, sometimes we're not, but at least it's a conversation, not a, an outright, you just don't meet the criteria. Um, we take time at each of the levels when they're in person to go through it with um, swimmers, coaches, and parents. And we also take the time to allow them to have another test, generally recommending a year, because it's going to take at least that long to um, have something change that would make a test relevant. All right, so it's not complicated. It follows the same procedures for all athletes and we put them into equitable groups. We have a classification rules and regulations of which only about a third of it is actually the testing. Uh, DART is starting a journey of learning what the other two thirds of the manual are um, about and what you need to be a really good advocate for a swimmer at a classification. We also need to know the rules and regulations because this is where the codes of exception apply. So classifiers must know how to actually do the evaluation and they must know enough about swimming to actually be able to apply. We're responsible for domestic classification and in responsible for the presentation, protests, et cetera, for international classification. So I just want to talk a tiny bit about protests because um, there sometimes gets to be the idea that if we don't like a sport class, then we protest to get a different sport class. What happens is we have known a swimmer from the beginning through all the levels of classification, through all their performances, and based on myself and the others that I work with in Canada, we take a position on a sport class. Given that each sport class has about 20 points and the difference between let's say a high six and a low seven is not going to be very many points. Could be as many as one point, could be as many as 20 points, but it is a position we take. Then when the evaluation is done, we may only protest a violation of rules. So that's why one needs to know the other two thirds of that book, there can be. Once an evaluation is done internationally, they are posted and you get one hour to determine what you're going to do. The second opportunity to launch a protest is after the first appearance. So a swimmer, let's say, swims their S first appearance let's pretend it's a hundred backstroke. At the end of the morning session that is posted and we get 15 minutes to determine based on the outcome, based on having seen the sheets, 
being based on our history to write a protest. I can tell you it almost takes 15 minutes just to fill out the paperwork on the swimmer's number, age, date of birth, all of those things. So you have to be somewhat prepared ahead of time because 15 minutes is not very much. So we don't protest because we don't like something. There are many things I don't like, but I don't get to protest. Or if I do, I should really do it in the privacy of my own backyard. But internationally, we need to know the rules, be able to apply the rules, and then be able to successfully uh, support and have 150 euros in your pocket at any moment. Domestic classification falls under domestic operations and that's Suzanne Pollins in the office. So I am in a unique position in that many of the jobs I have uh, fall under domestic whether it's the e-module for para-learning or performance standards or point charts, those are all domestic operations. They are key to the development of high performance. Um, the international high performance is Wayne um, Lomas. And then who actually is responsible as the uh, na nation that belongs to IPC is the CPC, and we act on behalf of them. And that works quite well. And we go only to the CPC when we are taking something above uh, World Para Swimming or IPC. And there are various levels in which we can appeal things if we believe something didn't go the way it should. So we're a role model. I say that because we include way more impairments than any other uh, classification system. And we have helped athletics and others to develop their system. We did not in 2000, when the intellectually impaired swimmers were outed, you know, uh, voted off the island, whatever you want to, made not eligible. We never ever took them off our list. It was my belief and that of Michelle Callens, and we made a, quite a strong stand for this in 2000 that they would be back. I honestly, and I am stubborn as a mule and I hang on for a long time. I would have never, I would have lost all the money in the world in 2000. I would not have thought it would take 10 years, but because we never eliminated them, we never had to start again. And when you look south to US Paralympics, they have a very complicated relationship with the organization that represents intellectual athletes. We don't have that. We also are part of Swimming Canada. Swimmer, para swimmers in the United States are uh, function under US Paralympics. And most of them belong to US swimming clubs but there's not a smooth transition as there is here. So it's easy to request online. You fill it out, international. Uh, it's like that Hollywood line. You don't call us, we call you. Um, there are two documents on the website and they've just been um, updated to have more uh, definitive language. And to be clearer, now that we have been uh, doing international classification only at World Series events since 2017, the standards for the minimal requirements, the performance standards haven't changed. Um, I do run numbers. I do look at people. I look at what percentages people are off world uh, 
uh, minimal qualifying standards for Tokyo, METs for Tokyo, the same for worlds going forward, looking at who would be eligible for Canada Games if only they had an international class. So do keep track of that. I'm never unhappy when a coach emails me and says, wow, we got one of those standards, because I think that is to be celebrated. It is, however, not an intel entitlement that we will take that swimmer forward. For one thing, we're in a unique and difficult situation in that because we get uh, reviews assigned to our athletes, we spend more of our classification slots renewing senior team members than we get uh, new spots. So I want to thank any coaches on this call who in the last two months have heeded my call that says, hurry up, wait, hold your breath. I might be able to take you to Poland. Hurry up, keep holding your breath a little longer, a little longer. I might be able to take your athlete to U.S. Paralympics um, event, which we call Can-Ams, and I think they have another name for it, some sort of championships. Um, so it it's always looking for the opportunity. I have agreed to make classification a priority for this year for me, which really just breaks my coaching heart because I honestly think that's where I provide the uniqueness in this job. This is what the classification sheet looks like. If you go to classification process, uh, it's not gonna show me maybe a different slide. It will open up and show the what happens on the day of classification for level two or level three. It also talks about uh, the technical tests and what's required. Uh, I, oh, we're going backwards, sorry. Didn't say I was good at this. So you need to have a, ver a qualifying health condition. So the language that's used internationally is the language of World Health Organization and isn't always the language we use, right? So this is documentation only. We need to update our form because um, if somebody tells us that a swimmer has arthrogryphos poses four limbs, um, we're not really sure whether they can get their arms over their head or not at that point. So we're going to be adding a little bit more information and we're gonna to try to make it a bilingual um, document so that it's easier for us to manage. But it's pretty simple. You go online, you request it, you get forms, you get them filled out by a professional and they come back, they're evaluated and it's done. In, you know, most get done within a month of the request. Uh, COVID makes it difficult for people to make appointments. Um, you have to verify the minimal impairment at all levels. So for those with intellectual impairment, it's like a um, affidavit that's signed by a specialist who verifies the tests that have been done. For the visually impaired, their ophthalmologist, although COVID, et cetera, I've been um, looking at optometrist reports as well. Um, then it doesn't just get screened by myself. I have a partnership with Blind Sports and all of them are sent to a classifier who has been trained internationally to evaluate visually impaired athletes. So they, they get a double take. And then all those that are physically impaired are, are seen in person. Level three is the same deal. It's more verification. The visually impaired must see a classifier uh, as in the same way those with physical impairment and for those with an intellectual impairment, they must send me a document which has the necessary scores in it. 
right? This is what we do for PIs. Um, a swimmer must pass the float test, right? To move on. This is there. So often what we do at a level two is if we can teach the float and it shows the potential, we will go on. If they cannot maintain on the surface and the only way they really manage is in a constant motion, we're more inclined to not complete the test, okay? We do five, well, six standard tests. We strength, coordination, range of movement, loss of limbs, so we measure good uh, long limbs or remaining limbs to short limbs or dysmalia limbs. We measure body height, and we measure leg length difference. I have examples all the way along so that when Darda sends this to you, you can read them. It basically is the Reader's Digest version of the classification manual, right? So when we get to the technical test, this is the page in the classification manual. It ha when I presented this to my classifiers, they were not good with a Venn diagram. Uh, it just seemed like there were so many decisions. And also I thought, oh my God, if I was a coach and I was sent this, I would not like Janet. So we have changed that and I've got it written out a little later, right? The technical portion of the evaluation is independent of the physical assessment. Prior to 2018, you did a physical assessment and then you did a technical assessment to verify the physical assessment. Now you have good documentation. You do the physical assessment as an inventory what's in, on the shelf in the store, what's missing on the shelf. Then a completely different test is the technical test in which each segment of the body is rescored. So when we're doing a classification, they have to take into account three strokes for the S free, back, and butterfly. We could argue whether butterfly should be hooked in with breaststroke, but that's an argument that's been going on since at least 1992. And there's been no change. And the reason that is, is because it's a symmetrical movement, not an asymmetrical movement. In the physical test, each segment of the body is accounted for. So if you look at your shoulder, there's forward flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation. Each and every one of those, depending on the score, and we always have to convert to one to five for counting, uh, get a score. So you could have a variety of ones to five. When you go to the technical test, the shoulder is given one score. So you could see that if on the bench, uh, in the physical assessment, you had a range of one to five, but on the technical test, they were given a five, that the score rounds up. Same way the score can round down. As with trunks, and legs, right? So it is somewhat broken up, but they're in big hunks instead of small hunks because in swimming, the limb is seen as a whole, not as segments. And one is a, um, an inventory and one is a determination, right? So I'm thinking there's going to be questions very soon about that. Ah, my slide that I expected much earlier in my presentation. 
how clever. This is what happens when you hit process because this um, uh, gives you everything you need to know about doing uh, one to three by impairment group, visual, intellectual, or physical. The rest is the technical tests. So the technical tests are always there. If you anticipate your swimmer is going to have classification, nothing stops you from practicing the things that are there. Um, note that if you are neurologically impaired, you will be expected to have your swimmer swim 650s on pace. It is, I think, 60% effort and we usually use their best event. So it's not onerous. It is outstanding to me and my colleagues how many people come to classification and they have never done pace before or the swimmer has never learned butterfly and yet they want a sport class. So I need to have a full profile. I know that there it may be really modified what butterfly looks like in somebody who's an S2. And then again, it needs to be that it's evaluated because it's part of the whole inventory of what the swimmer can do and how the codes of exception will do. We've tried to write out um, what happens in a day. This uh, document started with Lindsay Taylor because we were asked so often what to expect. So eventually we just made it a handout and then in time it was posted on the website. The water test, this is how it's written out. Uh, it can be determined by the technical classifier. There are very clear things that are in the webs on the website but there are the things that they must be able to demonstrate. So I'm not very, um, not empathetic, but I, I grow weary of my swimmer can't float because they're too severely impaired because, or because they're a boy or because they're too skinny. So, I just flashed them pictures of Jacob Brayshaw, who's an S2 skinniest boy I know who floats really well because they were committed to it. And it improved his posture for all his strokes, which many of we had to make up because of the severity of his impairment, right? So if we can teach them in the test, we do. Uh, definitely am grumpy when I meet up with a swimmer in on my coach hat on who hasn't worked on any of their floats. I can tell you that the high performance center in Montreal does floats. And my favorite swimming pool name in all the world is in Northern Poland. And the pool is called the floating arena. So you notice that all the kicks are from a float without pushing. I don't want to see somebody slow down or assume they're going to slow down. I strongly feel, coach half of me, is that we have to be able to generate power in our kicks and we have to have posture and control of our trunk and our legs before we do anything with our arms. And here is this lovely 650s. So neurological impairments will be acquired brain injuries, uh, MS, Parkinson's, dystonia, CP, something that originates in the brain. If it's like spinal cords, um, uh, arthrogryposis, amputations, dysmalias, um, it, it doesn't require the um, same thing. I'm going to try and shut this alarm off, people. I apologize. It just doesn't want to. Okay.
Um, so being prepared for that, at least having them have an idea of what it is. When somebody comes in a level two, I ought, the technical classifier will give the instructions. And many times we ask the coaches too, because I always joke and say they, obviously your swimmer doesn't um, speak Janet. Um, an example, what happens internationally is on these, um, on the swims, which are a hundred meters, they ask them to start out moderate and then to come back really strong. And for most Canadians, that's doing a build to race pace at the end, you know, but it does depend what you call something in your workout, whether they understand. And uh, COVID masks, uh, water in your ears, uh, often we ask the coaches to give the instructions, right? I don't think this point score has changed in three decades. We have taken out the SB9s uh, because, why do we do that? Because we found that there wasn't a big difference in breaststroke, in results, and in impairments, and there were not um, that many SB 10s. So I think 1999, we reviewed every breaststroker in the world and there hasn't been an SB 10 for years. Right, VI, it's um, total blindness. Uh, you could have a black white sense, uh, pinprick, uh, light, but it's basically when your hand is in front of you, you don't know your hand is in front of you. Um, S12, hand in front of you, you know it's yours. And then S13 is a combination of interesting acuity and visual field. So you can have somebody who doesn't recognize the swimmer beside them, but their visual acuity at the angle it is in their eye, they can actually read the scoreboard. You know, having visual um, field in your uh, the northeast corner of your eye is not very useful in racing, but it does mean that you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you what your time was. Um, 14s need to have been intellectually impaired since they before the age of 18. This eliminates acquired head injuries who have complete recovery. This is a guideline from INISPID, which is the international um, organization that represents uh, intellectually impaired athletes. So level one, they have a professional, can be their doctor, their psychologist, their um, special ed teacher sign it. Level two, they must indicate what the testing is that supports the um, criteria. And level three, we see the document. Codes of exception. So can I ask Darda? Uh, when I look at my screen, I see the list of uh, uh, participants. Is that how my screen shows up or can you guys read the whole thing? We can read your screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, I can't, which is great. I think I know what it is, right? So codes of exception are also called rule exceptions. The correct rule is codes of exception. And I've been trying to write that everywhere, but rule exceptions kind of sounds like we're cheating, but it's kind of the exception. And they allow somebody who's physically unable to do something to not be disqualified for it. So if you have no arms, a two hand touch and breaststroke might not be something you could do. Or if you can't hold on to the backstroke starts, we also give them for safety, you know, so we don't 
say to the totally blind kids, nope, until, you know, you're uh, just find the wall, it's there, we give them a tapper. Uh, there is a rule around opaque goggles that they must wear it because tappers can be at any visual impairment. So you could be, use a tapper as a, an 11, you must. At least I don't know any that cannot use a tapper that are that reliable in the stroke count. Um, but 12s and 13s and those with visual, and I mean, physical impairment or intellectual impairment for the purpose of safety can also use tappers. Um, they are, all the codes are assigned at classification. So when I go with an international swimmer, I need to argue for one arm fly if I believe that's the code that should be there. As a rule, if you have both legs involved, you will have a, a code for breaststroke kick, which will say show intent to kick or leg drag. If you have a sound limb and an involved limb, you will get right foot must turn out or left foot must turn out. So it is determined by the amount of impairment they are given at classification. And I just want to mention that there is a new code that has nothing to do with impairment, but because we're trying to introduce coaching hat on, um, in, uh, more levels for para swimming. We have set up a set of junior standards for provinces. It's up to them to use it. At the time of classification, we will give a J if the swimmer is new, and we will determine when they will lose that J. We are working on making it automatic because right now it's going to be manual checking results on average. Um, and we're new to this and the intention is there. We're just right now it's going to be kind of labor intensive for us. But the intention is that a swimmer would do three uh, provincials you know, a spring, a summer, a spring, and then they would move to senior, depending, of course, on the impairment. So if you're an S2, that's much different than S10s who can make all the provincial standards by the time they're 12, because they're set on a continuum and it's harder to build a foundation for good skills uh, when you're more impaired, it takes just a lot more at the beginning. Uh, whereas if you're minimally impaired, you will get a very fast rise in performance. And then your continual performance improvement will be much slower than somebody in the one to five, because once they've got the basics, all they have to do is get better. Whereas you can get the times without having protect, perfected the basics uh, as a half a hand amputee or a single club foot or somebody uh, with mild CP. So the reds are all the codes that occur during swimming. And there is a... Um, corresponding rule in the rule book that goes with them. So you can argue. Um, hearing is any sport class, but all the rest are just at the start, right? And I put in my J here so I wouldn't forget. It will appear on the website and in the RTR as the first letter because it used to be a and then your numbers it will go j a and then the rest of the numbers because that way when we remove it we didn't have spacing and coding issues right so this is just a little bit of where they could um 
be used. And there are, uh, you'll get this, so you can check out the code, the connection there. So I just want to talk about one arm fly. So we determine this, it's determined at classification. And we are looking at how much range of movement and control there is going up versus how much range. And I can't actually see that one, but I assume you can. Um, in the observation assessment, we look at um, the stroke to verify it's in front, uh, that it is what we saw on the bench and what we saw on the technical. So level two sport classes are considered provisional. So when that changes, it wasn't that we were wrong or that the swimmer uh, outswam their sport class or any of those things that people talk about on the deck. More often it's because we were nice and we didn't stop the evaluation and we gave you your best guess. Now that we have a level one, we're not into best guesses. This is a technical sport. We want to be as right as possible for that athlete, but it's a range. Remember, there are top sixes and bottom sevens in the points. Determining where that line is, is something that we often don't get confirmation of till we take them international. So there is a little ass star, I'm not sure what it's called. It's there just for the officials because we still have swimmers who have not been reviewed in the 2018 manual. They were given to the end of 2020 to get that done and then 2021 and now it's 2022. After that, if they haven't been done, and there are certainly a lot of opportunities this season, they will go back to being a level one and will be assigned new codes. And it will be their responsibility to get themselves to a level two to be evaluated because we will have offered enough opportunity and it is becoming unfair to have them exist in the same range as everybody else who has been evaluated on the new 2018 manual, which for new coaches, new manual doesn't sound very new. That's almost four years ago. Um, that's just what I told you. What if they have more than one impairment? So my swimmer is intellectually impaired and has CP. Well, what is, I mean, the intellectual impairment may be a huge factor in the acquisition of the stroke, but in the actual racing, the swimmer requires codes in order to have it be fair. Now you will see level one, but mostly level two, she'll find S14s with A's. And that's because the, one of the hardest things to train them to do in a noisy, busy, confusing swim meet is to actually go to the block, stay at the block, swim the stroke they're supposed to swim at the block. And so there's no point in everybody failing or everybody being upset or whatever. So if I get one inquiry about how do I get them to stay at the blocks? Uh, how do I get him to go to the right lane? I just say, let's give you an A. By the time you're at level three, your job is to have taught that swimmer what the process is. Most of the time, it's maybe a year they even use the A. Um, but it does help, especially in smaller communities and smaller clubs where there are less staff to get people where they need to be, right? So I already talked about the um, tappers. When should a coach require request a review? Well, 
on the website and in the RTR, there are review years given. And we don't give it like March 2021. We give you our 2021 so you can choose. There isn't a problem with carrying a review forward for however long you want, provided it's not because of them never having been seen in the new manual, right? So you can request it when you see that it's required or when you think your swimmer has changed if at the time of classification, you're super unhappy, most times I don't have two teams, I will just give your swimmer a one-year review and we'll sort it out from there. Uh, if you have not been given a new sport class because of not being able to do the technical test, in Alberta recently, we taught her to float, we taught her how to do fly, we taught her how to turn, we taught the entire test. And what we told them is she's quick. She, the coach understands what she needs to do. We expect it will be six to eight months, but as soon as they're ready, they just put in a new request and we'll do it. So, um, NEs are just um, uh, don't give automatic reviews because then the NE is attached to their name and it's just, te you know, the way the software is. Um, and uh, so we're not doing that, but we always invite them to complete a new uh, request if, it, if the condition is progressive or just size, weight, and age will make a difference. So Darda, I'm feeling like maybe we should ask questions or I'm I think not that's sure. A great idea. The, um, Janet will be providing me with the slides and then I can send those out to everyone who is in attendance here um, for more details. Um, but at this point, um, oh look, Janet, you're at the end anyways. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, if you are comfortable, um, you can unmute and you can ask a question or you may type it into the chat. Please remember that this is being recorded just so you're aware for your comfort level. Okay, so I'm happy to take um, specific questions about swimmers. As far as impairment sharing goes, I know most of your swimmers and we have big broad categories, neurological, orthopedic, spinal cord, right? So that avoids us sharing medical information. But if you wanna ask something about your swimmer, something that's happened, something you anticipate happening, Janet, you were just that thorough. I am impressed. Wow. If anyone thinks of any questions at a later date, I'm sure that you can always reach out to Janet. Her, I can give you her email or her email is on Swimming Canada's website. Um, if there are no more questions, I want to thank everyone for coming. I also want to remind you that our next session is actually next Wednesday, December 1st. It's at 1 p.m. and we will be discussing the para-coach pathway um, and we will be having Mike Thompson, who is the head coach of the High Performance Centre in Quebec, will be joining me to discuss how he got involved in para swimming and where um, his trajectory went and the different ways that he learned the knowledge that he needed. So I hope that people will be interested in attending that. Um, and we look forward to continuing conversations about para-swimming in our next two sessions. At this point, I will stop the recording and thank everyone for coming.